What's up, Capoeira Nation? Welcome back to the Capoeira Experience Podcast. Thank you so much for coming back. And this episode is very cool because I got interviewed by two friends. So stay tuned for the whole episode. Listen to the end. I'm going to split this episode in two because it was a really cool, interesting conversation. And it took a little bit longer than an hour, which is super cool to share my experience. So stay tuned and let's go rock and roll. What's up, Capoeira Nation? Yeah, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> These are different voices than the one that you usually hear welcoming you. But don't worry, Isu Tokashi, she is with us. We are yes. turning the tables and interviewing him today. Nice. Um, yeah, you started this project almost three years ago. I think your anniversary is December 27th, maybe, for the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. You got it right. You have 108 episodes under your cord, yes. something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so you put out a lot of content, both um, interviews with people all over the world and in different parts of the Copward experience, and also your own content, right? Like yes. reading bio lessons. And so we want to we wanna interview you today. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. When well, you mentioned the, the uh, to do like a reverse interview, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I never heard that. <laughs> yeah, so I am Instructora Folla Seca in Madison, Wisconsin, with Haices do Brasil Capoeira, which is your first group, I believe. And yeah, yeah. Um, Caju, also with Haices do Brasil. And I, I really wanted to bring Caju into the interview because he has some he has some great questions for you. And I think that's also the name of your your best for your BFF in, yeah, in yeah. Venezuela and Capoeira. Yes, yes, yes. yes. The, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, he passed when he was 23. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was 20 when he passed, but he's, he, he was the best friend ever. You speak a lot about him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he's, he, was like a, he was like a close brother, like a really, really close brother. Yeah, yeah. And what do you guys have in mind? Oh, yeah. Well, um. So I wanted to start a little bit with your, your story, but since you've told it, you, you told your story in the very yeah. first episode of your podcast, um, and you were 15, right, when you, first, when you started Capoeira in middle school? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, the, is 15 middle school here in the U.S.? Yeah, right. Uh, you could be, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was, yeah, 15. Uh, yeah, 15. You traveled to the university, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was 2001 when it started. And then I saw in, in, in Venezuela, we can just like sit on the ground and just have our breakfast there, sit, sit on the ground. And I was with my friend. And then I saw his brother practicing some, like he, they were doing like ahmadas and au, a bunch of macacos. There was a very short guy that... He, he used to do backflips and stuff just on the ground. And he was doing like a hamada or backflip. And I was like, Jesus, man, that's really cool. And then I was like, they, they started talking about like, well, let's do like a hamada and let's, let's break the macaco now. And then I asked him like, dude, what, what are they talking about? Macaco, like ahmadas and all those kind of stuff. And, and he was like, yeah, yeah, they're, they, they're practicing capoeira. And I was like, capoeira, what is that, man? And then he was like, is this afro martial art that they practice at this university? Uh, you should check it out, man, and see if you like it. I was like, dude, tell me when, and we'll go together. And then he was like, well, wait for me tomorrow. That was on a Monday. Wait for me tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, 3, 3 p.m. outside of, of the school, and uh, I'll get you, and we'll go straight there. Oh, yeah, cool. When I got home, I called another friend. I was like, dude, you got to come to this class with me. Go, come check it out. It's really cool. Uh, let's go check it out together. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. None of them showed up. <laughs> it was like, I wait outside of the school until like four. And I was like, man, well, you know what? I'm just going to go. I'm just going to find. I'm, I'm, if I get lost, worst case scenario, I just want to run and come back home. And then uh, it was like 20 minutes right on the uh, train, on the subway. When I got to, to, to the subway station, it was it's two exits. It was on one left and right. Uh, yeah, left and right. And then... I was like, well, I don't, I don't know which exit to take. I'm just going to go this way. So I went left. I went 
looking around is is the that university is one of the biggest universities in Caracas in, in the capital. And I was like, well, I'm just gonna start walking and see if I find it. Is this thing is huge? I've never been here. <laughs> I was 15 years old in a, this big ass university, and then I started walking and walking and walking and when I get to the university, it was like a fork. It was like three, three paths. And I was like, I'm just going to stick to my left. <laughs> so I walk into the left, to the left, and it took me right straight to Capoeira. And oh, then, yeah, and then I was, I was like, well, my friend told me that they all wear all whites. If I see a bunch of people doing a bunch of movements on whites, that's probably a place. <laughs> when, when I was walking, getting closer, they were in the hada, uh, just everybody sitting down. And I saw his brother with a beating ball in the hand. I was like, oh, he's here. He's right here. Okay. And then I, I like, sp- uh, like start walking fast. And then I like wave at him. He like not, not me. And then uh, uh, I remember that that day he w- they were practicing malandro, malandro, malandro song. And, and uh, they, yeah. they were like rolling down on the ground and then concrete. And then I asked him, I asked, hey, you know, like I want to try class and how this works. And I was like, go to the instructor uh and ask him about classes see he, he's in charge of it. oh yeah cool i went there asked him i was like hey you know uh he sent me here he told me that you you're in charge of the classes i was like yeah your first class yeah yeah my first class well the first class is free go to this group and wait for me there he, they, we were probably like 15 people and i'm the only one till now and and then since then <laughs> yeah of all of the people that you saw that day yeah yeah, wow. yeah. Even my friend, my friend joined me like uh, two weeks later, the one that I caught on the phone. He joined me like two weeks later, and then he stopped Capoeira, and then I continued until now. I never stopped until now. Wow. And didn't you describe, I'm trying to remember that first episode, how you you had to leave class early often because your mom wanted you to be back. And then yes. finally one time you're like, you know what? Skip this. I'm going to stay yeah. for all of it, like stay for the hall. That- yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because at, at the beginning uh the instructor explained us the like the first class he was like well if you guys stay until the very end you guys can see the the final circle on we call it harder and then where we have the instruments and we have everything and we were the entire group on that moment when i started we were probably like 30 30 to 40 people and it was a big harder and then it, it was i saw like five minutes and i saw the time it started getting dark oh no my mom is gonna get mad at me i gotta go and then I did that for the first three months or something like that. I don't remember. And then one time I was like, I think I can stay five more minutes. And I saw a little bit, they started seeing, and I was like, oh man, now it's getting too late. And I, I got to go back. And then, and then so on, and then five minutes, and then five minutes, and then it turned to like, I was so like engaged with the Hada that they stopped the Hada. That, you know, usually at the end of the Hada, people start talking, the teachers start talking. When I saw the time, I was like, oh, my God, it's like an hour later. I should be home. <laughs> and then, until like one day it become till like it wasn't till midnight. <laughs> well, wow. my friends just missing around. Yeah. yeah. And my mom was like, why are you so late home? I told you to be home. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, mama, why are you straining? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you were 15 and now you've been playing for 20 years? 20 years. Yeah. 35 years. Now. Yeah. And- so I wonder back to like you've you've retold that experience. I've heard you tell it a couple of times. And I wonder, is there something 20 years later that you missed when you were 15 about your first your first glance at Capoeira, like your that first um maybe falling in love that you now yeah. like that's yeah. deep bender you see differently now? Yeah, yeah. The that I miss is uh well number one that i wish i had more capoeira around me like here in this in my city i'm pretty much the only one teaching here number two uh usually when i i my class was a uh, four and you you we had two classes well one four to six and six to eight and then i used to be there i used to get there probably like 3 30 so all, all of us start practicing, start training all the kicks and all the movements and backflips and blah, blah, for the first five, five years. And that I, I miss that a lot of like getting early class and having 10 of my friends in there. 
and and start practicing and messing around I already tired before the class and then <laughs> but it's, it's that that like friendship in there and that, that's what I want to build here and slowly slowly is is getting there and and I I want that here I want here in, in Indianapolis cool cool yeah. hey uh Kashishi, so following up on this experience in Caracas can you can you talk more about the how how was capoeira in Caracas at the time that you were doing? Like, what is, you had your friends and you had this group. Were there many other groups? Were there, how, how was the, the cap, capoeira experience? Yeah, yeah. There, uh, we, we used to be two, two biggest group, Capoeira Sensala and Jaices do Brasil. Uh, before them, it was, uh, it was just, uh, they used to call it uh, Cumbe, which is, was, before Sensala. So, you, and then a uh, Capoeira teacher came to, a Brazilian Capoeira teacher came to Venezuela and he brought Sensala to Venezuela. And then the two of the teachers, one of the oldest students, they decided to be like, hey, you know, we don't, we don't really believe on, on, your, on your stuff. We want to just play. And they traveled to Brazil, Boavista. He's like, 26 hours from Caracas. It's right on the border in Caracas and, and sorry, in Venezuela and Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, the state uh, is Joraima. Uh -huh. Yeah, Joraima. So, uh, uh -huh. Boavista, one of the cities there. Mm -hmm. And then he, they travel there. There were three instructors that travel there and they found high schools in Brazil. And we, by back then, it was Contra Mestre KMB uh -huh. uh, uh, from high schools in Brazil. And then we brought. Uh, high to Brazil to Venezuela, and then that, that's when it started. When I started, they already had a split, and it was like this like negative rivalry in between both of them the, the oldest, older teachers, and the older teachers and Sensalas in both groups. And it always was like, we don't, we don't get together with Sensala, and the Sensala was like, we don't get together with High to Brazil. And, and this is like mid 90s, right? What you're talking about. You say, say that again. Is it the mid 1990s? No, 2000. Uh, 2000, yeah. When I started in 2001, so when it, uh, I believe the first Capoeira, Capoeira, Capoeira in Venezuela was around 1995, 96, or 98, in between the gap, I don't remember. And then in 2000, I believe they split. And 2001, uh, High School Brazil was pretty much new in, in Venezuela when I started. There was like one of the teachers actually was, uh, they just got back then. I don't know. I don't know what is the the graduation level now in high school Brazil, but they got a uh, uh, blue blue white court, and then apparently it was like a like a stagiario, like a some sort of like transition, and then after that they got blue blue yeah blue all blue, and then they went up from there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, when I started with the Capoeira, there was very aggressive, <laughs> like, uh -huh. like scary aggressive. And, and I remember one time, uh, probably like within the year or two years I started, they did this like Hada for peace. <laughs> and peace oh, wow. was the last thing in the Hada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, it was like people bleeding and people throwing each other people kicking each other really hard and he, he was very very aggressive yeah it's it's interesting because i you know my experience with capoeira is not long yeah. at, at all but you know just talking to some people who have more experience uh, from brazil and they describe the scene of capoeira in brazil in the 80s as something like that i don't know if it was all over the country probably not but in some parts that there was a lot of conflict between groups and there was yeah, a lot yeah. of, uh, you know aggressiveness which has been i guess tampered since then yeah yeah it, it changed a lot it changed a lot because and it's really cool to see that transition from like very aggressive to now it's very playful you just want to have fun you see people like having fun and a bunch of groups coming together and i was actually talking about this with uh mr dan from kohdan Gion in israel and and well ex kohdan Gion in israel and he he described the same thing. Like, 
back then when he started Capoeira was very aggressive. It was very like competitive and uh, Brazil, the the version, the Brazilian version of MMA, they call it Vale Tudo. Uh -huh. And then the the back then they used to call it Capoeira Vale Tudo because he was aggressive. Yeah, like punches, like close punch, everything, man. Beating balls, hitting each other with beating balls. He was aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard one time too, one, and I guess I asked the same. Uh, one of the guys, one of the Brazilian guys, I you know, was like, hey, you know, like, he said, he said, Capoeira in Brazil, very aggressive too. And he was like, yeah, <laughs> he, we, like, sometimes there's people like stabbing each other and stuff because they hate each other or like shooting each other. And yeah, he, he was very crazy stuff, very crazy time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering also about the demographic changes that you've seen personally in your 20 years. So in your time in Venezuela, when you yeah. first started playing to visiting Brazil, to playing for so many years now here, um, when you started, who was the, top, the, the typical capoeirista? And have you seen that change? Like, uh, like on, on, on like- Like the first day that you walked into that class and you saw the people in the hall there. Like was it mostly young men or teenage, oh, teenage okay. boys? You know, and so like who who did you who would you typically see like in your first year years? And then how did you see that? Has that demographic change in your experience and and how? When when I started in two thousand one, I saw a lot a lot of like in between late teens. To early 20s that's pretty much that, that was pretty much the the age gap in between all of us mm -hmm. and in even my teacher my my instructor back then i think they were like 25 or something like that really really young capoeiristas and it was mostly men it was and it was probably like 10 percent woman but when i started the women were like like kicking like it, it was like hardcore <laughs> they mm -hmm. they kick each other and they was same same thing like the kind of woman you'll be like i don't want to play man don't kick me <laughs> yeah it's like i don't want to play the hard hold on hold on just chill <laughs> because he was he, they, they also got intense and it was really cool because you back then how was that misconception of like oh woman play all like like cutie you know and then and they they work like kind of like against that and be like well man you were just capoeiristas too you know, we, we just we want to be capoeiristas too. We don't want to be all cutie. Don't call me like that. It's just normal capoeiristas. And then like, hardcore, hardcore, hardcore capoeiristas. And then that was pretty much. And here in the U.S., yeah, I've seen the, band, the, the scale kind of like going 50-50 now with, with the female presence in capoeira, which, and, which is really cool. Like yourself, like leading capoeira, capoeira classes in, in different cities, which is really, really cool. And the most of the time I seen Capoeira schools are usually, uh, back then was usually uh, led by men. And now I see a lot in, and it was really cool to see it because I, I grew up with a pretty much a single mom. And I had like that female strong personality in my, in my life where was very, very female presence. So it's, really cool to see that uh, applying capoeira too where now it's a lot of like the woman presence is stepping up it's really really cool to see it mm -hmm. cool um i don't know if you have another question uh, no I, i'm just so i'm just wondering you now as, as a student and now for many years as a teacher and then as an interview of maybe a, a hundred capoeira practitioners yeah um and just for you, Kashi, she, who is Capoeira for? Like, who is, who can participate in Capoeira? Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a cool question. I, I never got that, that kind of, and I never asked myself that question either. Uh, I, th I think Capoeira is for everybody. It doesn't matter. And like I always say, you know, is, is Capoeira for everybody. It doesn't matter color, how you look like, uh, where you're from, what you believe on, your politic. When everybody comes to the Hada, everybody speaks the same language. Like when I was talking to Contra Mesa Bamboo from Chicago, he, he said, uh, like, you know, I was uh, this country, I don't remember the country. And I, we were in the same house. 
and uh, I, I was with a different person from different country. He didn't speak English. And it was really hard for us to communicate. But when we, we came to the Hada, we speak the, we spoke the same language. Uh -huh. And it's, it's really, really cool to see those kind of stuff. And, and you know, I've seen people from Brazil, like before I start understanding Portuguese and people from France and people from the US, people from Caribbean islands and people from South America, different countries in South America. It's, it's really cool to China because I, I met people from China too. Uh, it's, it's really cool to see those those exchange of everybody you know is is uh somebody also told me i don't remember if i was on the podcast but capoeira adapts where it goes and it's, it's really cool to see that from little kids all the way to like really old people like like i'm talking about like i seen people that they started capoeira i don't know probably over 60 i don't think that's all but you know like after that 10 years he's already in 70s so he's he's Really cool to see that all that variety of ages and everything. It's really, I think Capoeira is for everybody. I guess I want to drill down a little bit more here because yeah. you as a teacher, I mean, we have this, we have that shared experience. And I, as a, now as a mom of two, yeah. I, so I both asked myself that question in terms of students and in terms of myself. And I think we've asked ourselves this question, Kaju and I have, um, like can Capoeira still be for us if our life experiences change? So even outside of, um, you know, where you are in the world or, or gender um, and all the demographic questions, like I asked myself that question around life experience. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for you, like if, um, if someone's able to, if someone's commitment changes, right. Or if yeah. they come in and they're interested in, this amount of capoeira versus like i can give innumerable hours per week yeah is capoeira for all of those folks like in your I, I in your so. yeah i think so because uh same thing like also uh i really like when i talked to mr cueca that he was like you know when we are capoeira we have the misconception of like capoeira is this outside entity of of mm -hmm. that we think is out and some of the other dimension that give us that energy, but we are the one that put in that energy there. And once we leave the room, there's no capoeira there, you know. And, and once you leave, where would you go? Capoeira is gonna go with you. I and yeah, and me too. And when I told my students, I was like, man, this is actually pretty cool. You know, it's we we are capoeira, and and even if you have 10 minutes to do capoeira music, a little jinga, that's that's still part of capoeira. And a lot of we, without throughout all the time, everybody's priorities changes, right? But and people get kids, or or people travel, or they get a new job, and and I'm pretty sure you can feed Capoeira somewhere if you find the time to to feed it there. And you, I I think everybody can do Capoeira, and you know, Rick Martin, he he's a really I'm pretty sure he's a pretty busy person. <laughs> And and he even uh, applies a little bit capoeira to to one of of before he his performances, and then there I think there's a video on Instagram where he's like, oh yeah, you know, before this performance I do a little bit the meditation, I do a little bit of yoga, and I also uh, uh, train a little bit of capoeira before before I go. And then if he's playing capoeira behind the scenes, but behind the scenario with with a teacher. I don't know, I don't remember the teacher, but but I was like, this man, see like. If we find those 10 minutes to play capoeira, there's capoeira. You 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 are capoeira, you know. Yeah. I didn't know that I have to look it up Ricky Martin. Song. <laughs> that's a good take. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good take. You know, like that, that you capoeira, uh, no matter um the, the I guess the way I hear you is like you're cap you capoeira no matter the extent of time or energy that you put it into it but yeah. as long as you do it um you know like truthfully like like the, that you enjoy what you're doing yeah yeah exactly exactly and, and so so to pick back to that and, and maybe it's the turn a little bit but um so capoeira you know it has this multiple it has a physical component to it yeah. right it yeah. has the music to it it has obviously all the history that uh to my to, you know like the way I I've heard about it and the experience, it's it's tied to, you know, 
slavery and, and uh, the, the Brazilian history and Af yeah. African history. So uh, with your experience, uh, what else have you seen? Have you seen, uh, you know, what cultural elements in Venezuela, for example, or other places do you see that, could, that are attached to capoeira, if any? You know, like, for example, when we, you know, like the Atabaque in Capoeira yeah. is a, a very important religious instrument. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In Candomblé, right? Yep. Or, yeah, yeah, Candomblé. Yeah. And so there is this, there is the, the space, I think, in, for the, in the Capoeira practice to incorporate this mystical element to it as well. Yeah. Or you can just stay on the physical component of it. Yeah. Like I know yeah. people who say, well, I'm not care much about or that I really like the workout, while other people embody the workout, but also the, you know, a bunch of symbolic component that's attached to the atabaki or... Yeah. So what's your, could you, can you talk a little bit about that, about both your experience, uh, your experience of living Capoeira and what you see in Venezuela or other places? Yeah, the the cool thing is, is my first, experience ever with any African roots connection was through Capoeira. And, and after that, because I was very young, I didn't go to, I didn't get a chance to travel that much. I start seeing, we have African expressions in Venezuela uh, called tambor. It's just like drumming and mm -hmm. which is, has different type of drums. It's not just like atabaque, it has different sizes. For in Venezuela, we have uh, I think it's three or four type of, of drums and each of them has different sound and each of them has different job in the, in the circle. And again, and, and as a, it's very interesting that almost they, that at least what I've seen the any African uh, expression or cultural, cultural expression, they all usually do like circles. And if, if you see videos and you look for, for Af like, Brazil uh, Afro martial arts, and there's many uh, uh, African martial arts, and almost all of them do in circles, and that comes back to capoeira, and then little things start clicking. Uh, also, through capoeira, I had a um, uh, a little connection with like orishas and all the stuff, and no, everybody knows, but I'm I'm a Paiji Santo in Venezuela, with a oh. with with a with the, the Venezuelan version of Candomblé. In Venezuela, we call it Santeria. Something. And yeah, in and, and Venezuela, uh, in Brazil, Xangó is, is one entity. In, in Venezuela, Xangó is a different entity from Agajú. Agajú is kind of like, like the, the volcano uh, representation of, of the Orisha. Like same thing like Xangó is from the, the lightning and, and and the, the the mainly force of of the energy so capoeira got me into that and when i saw elements of of the religion power i was like what i mean what is this 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 is like tied up with this is and then i i'm doing a little bit of research studying asking people in brazil and i found all the connections with orishas and and those expressions with through through capoeira and on the other hand too like it's not about religion right but mm -hmm. a lot of people think that spirituality and i think i mentioned this in one of my podcasts spirituality is not about religion right it's not about believing on on one specific entity it's about like a very deep connection with yourself and and this we, we can go for hours and talk about spirituality but it's like when you get in the zone right when athletes they when you really really focus they get in the zone when right. if if you get in the beating ball and then you play and you you there's a moment where you get that connection that's the zone that's the spirituality you know when you get the goosebumps and then the people everybody's connected and every, everybody's like on a different level and sometimes even when you get in the heart and you're like man i didn't know i could do this and it's it's that energy that that makes you makes you feel there and, and it's really cool to see all those connections all those uh little 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 bites from a lot of expressions come coming together with a couple yeah cool 
Yeah. The, the, does that answer your question? <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's really cool to see all those African expressions in capoeira and the, the singing and the bringing focusing the energy into, into those two players, you know, and, and, and like Santeria is, is, you sing, you also sing on kind of play too, but like you sing to bring that energy, that the representation of the energy of the Orisha or, or to, to call that energy to you. And, and it's really cool. And it's, it's, it's really nice to see those, those expressions. I really appreciate this part of the conversation because it's it's such a good example of what you were speaking to. People come to the Halda, right, with different experiences. Like yeah. you might kneel at the Pe, and you're a Pai Chisanto and you have all of these other connections that you're bringing, right? And then somebody else might be kneeling down in front of you and they might just like only be thinking about trying to work in a little combination or yeah. the physical part of the game. And yeah. you could still have a beautiful game with the other person. Totally, right? totally, like it's, totally, yeah. I, I remember um, you met Professor Kwachi, right? Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, some years ago, I would kneel at the pay with him every time we would play a game. He would um, like hold my hands and, and like close his eyes. And one time I asked him like, what are you, so what are you doing when you're closing your eyes when we're like yeah, about yeah. to go on? And he said, I'm praying that I have a good game and I'm praying that you have a good game. Nice. I've done and, that a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, I just like that, that really touched me. And that doesn't happen for me every time I play for sure. Yeah. Right. Um, but it often happens when I play with him and there are sometimes I'll kneel down to the pay with somebody. And I, like, I remember that and I'll, I'll wish that for the other person. I'll wish that for myself. And I'll wish that for the, also for the, for whatever connection can happen between the two of us. And I yeah. think that, yeah, anyway, I just, um, you made me think of that. I, I appreciate that so much that people are coming to, to the pay, to the Hada with totally, yeah. all different reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's funny that, that sometimes for people that never seen and they don't understand how that works or what that means is, I don't, especially beginners, right? Like the first two years is like, oh, why these people are like, in front of the beating ball or <laughs> doing those signs like you know and and because i've seen people where they get a weird face you know it's like okay yeah well, why do i need to kneel on oh no kneel like crouch down on front of the beating ball and it's like it's, it has it has a it's it's a ritual on that moment it's, it's just part of respect to those that were before us and and same thing with like for, for example and the people that singing in the beating ball right like when when Mr. Papio was on the beating ball, is he's just like man, that, the voice like brings you to to that element and and the energy that you you can totally feel through his voice, especially also because he's a musician, uh, most musician, yeah. But through his voice, he's, he's he expressed that energy, and he's so cool to to. When I was on the hot, I was like, oh man, I want to play now. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it makes you like when you go to a concert, right? When, when, and sometimes we, we don't see those little things. When you go to a concert, it's really bad music. You, ah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I want to just turn around and leave. But when it's a really good music and everybody's like dancing and all that, you like, you start moving the feet, you start like moving the head, and you know, the, the energy starts moving. And it's, it's, same thing happens in the hot, the exact same thing yeah that's, yeah that's right thank you guys for listening so for to the whole lot. three two one thank you guys for listening to the entire episode this is this episode was super fun to go look back and and to look back to through my entire capo experience to my entire uh, 20 years of capoeira very little details that i sometimes i forgot so uh it was very interesting to share my my capo experience this is the first part of these um, small two episodes and stay tuned for the next episode next week because i will share the second part of this episode okay thank you so much thank you so much for listening thank you so much for getting this far remember please subscribe give us a thumbs up on facebook or youtube please subscribe to the youtube channel this is going to help us and help me to get bigger numbers and bigger subscribers so we can give more information okay please if you're listening i know you're listening i know you're watching please 
give me a subscribe give him a give, give me a like okay i know you're watching right here or listening all right have an amazing day thank you so much for tuning in and listening every single episode especially the episode we just did all right thank you so much peace